If you are of a country, then you know it by lifting your eyes, by seeing the tapestry of its trees, the freshness of its winds and the color of its sky, the pattern of its clouds. The Caribbean Republic of Haiti lies 50 miles southeast of Cuba. It shares the island of Hispaniola with the Dominican Republic. Shaped roughly like a mouth open in a scream, it has two principal cities, Port-au-Prince and Cap Haitian. start our journey at Kenskov, a mile-high village overlooking Port-au-Prince. Viewing this subtropical city from the mountains, it has all the markings of a typical Caribbean resort. When you visit the several blocks of well-groomed parks and governmental buildings, such as the Presidential Palace, you are impressed with the clean, white splendor of the capital city. This area is the playground for fun-loving Jean-Claude Duvalier, alias Baby Doc. He became president for life at the age of 19, when his president for life father, Papa Doc, died in 1971. population of five million, there seems to be four million painters in Haiti. Along the boulevards, rows of colorful primitives depict the rich mythical world in which Haitians live. You can buy most of these oils and watercolors for the price of a haircut. However, there is a generation of fine painters in Haiti who have attained international renown. If a tourist happens to wander just one block away from this charming area, he is likely to suffer from sudden shock. For near the waterfront, one sees what is more like the real Haiti, the hottest, poorest, and most densely populated country in the Western world. This is the Croix de Basal, the most pungent, filthiest marketplace imaginable. Once right on the waterfront, it was blocked off by a high cement wall so that its smoke and smells wouldn't offend the American tourists when they disembarked briefly from their luxury cruise ships. The marketplace has a history of slavery. In the 18th century, merchants auctioned off untamed blacks just off the ships from Nigeria. It has been 10 years since we visited this marketplace, and it hasn't changed much. It's still a behavioral sink of garbage and sweat, of rotting meat and vegetables. There has been one improvement, however. Most people now wear shoes, a definite advantage since raw sewerage flows through its muddy streets. Mama, mama, 
Shopping Haitian style is one of the most entertaining scenes in the street theater of Port-au-Prince. First, you pick over the merchandise looking for imperfections. Then you become thoroughly indignant at the asking price and possibly make a false departure. Finally, after the haggling is complete, you consummate the deal in friendship. Unlike most of the other Caribbean islands, you can roam the marketplace in Haiti sensing no feeling of hatred for the white man. Haitians really never developed any sense of racial discrimination, although their history is scarred with slavery, ruthless kings, and colonial exploitation. While the city's character is shaped by its prevailing poverty, some of its inelegance is offset by a handful of stunning old French homes that are befitting a Charles Adams spectacular. These haughty gingerbread mansions adorned with wooden lace were built during the Victorian age for the mulatto aristocracy which dominated Haiti until the 1950s. The most famous of all the French mansions is the Grand Hotel Olufsen, interred upon a hill above the city. This is not to say that the Olufsen is dead, only that it's buried. Buried in its Victorian dress of white lace. Buried in a tomb of overgrown shrubs and ancient vines. Buried in the decadence of Haiti. Buried alive, thriving. It is said that the whole moldy structure of Hotel Olufsen was once made of wood, but because it has been constantly besieged by termites, only the paint remains. 900 coats of white on white, adhering to nothing but themselves. A few minutes on a speedboat through a natural water canal leads you to one of the few decent beaches in Haiti. We are landing on the island of Ebo, about 40 minutes from Port-au-Prince. Unlike most of the West Indies, Haiti is not renowned for its beaches. It's not that there aren't any. The problem is simply the lack of roads. There's no way to get to them. The island of Ebo, with fine white sand and turquoise blue water, is one of the few that is accessible. Enjoying sunbathing with us is our good friend and host, Gerard Pierre-Louis. We met Gerard 20 years ago during our first trip to Haiti, and we have been his house guest during every one of our six trips to his country.
to Prince, commuters gather around a suburban bus stop. They are waiting for a tap-tap, individually painted red or blue buses which take you around town for nine cents a ride. These Japanese-built buses would never be recognized in Japan. Each bus has a name, and each is elaborately hand-painted to tell a personal story. They may depict such things as the love affairs of the owner. They fantasize about animals and flowers, or portray epics from the Bible and the life of Christ. No two are alike. Indeed, these bright traveling billboards advertise the Haitians' joyous philosophy to the world. Most tap-taps eventually end up in Central City, at the famous Iron Market. Consisting of block-size iron structures, it is the largest and busiest shopping center in the country. Within these big red buildings, vendors bawl out their monotonous refrain, selling everything imaginable. Take your pick of fabrics, baskets, straw hats, cooking utensils, clothes, sandals. It's a kind of flea market and wool co rolled into one. Most transactions here involve only a few pennies. Poverty is rampant. You can't walk far without being followed by beggars asking for a dime. One young American secretary who now lives there was heard to say, it used to tick me off to hear these beggars cry, oh, missy, missy, gimme, gimme, gimme. Now, she said, I just tell them that I gave it the office. Around midday, this great marketplace suddenly bursts alive. As we drive slowly through an adjacent street, the crowds part to let us make our way.
Right next to the iron market is the mahogany market. Here you can observe the entire mahogany manufacturing process from beginning to end. The wood is first cut into rough slabs, then deftly hand chiseled by local artisans. The mahogany is carved in all shapes and sizes, from 10 foot high war masks to delicate figurines. These artisans chip away from dawn until dusk for less than a subsistence wage. The average annual income of a Haitian is only about $90 a year, making them among the poorest people on earth. Although there is now a minimum wage law in Haiti which guarantees $1.50 a day, most employers consider this excessive and find loopholes to avoid it. While the men do the carving, it's the women's job to do the final sanding, staining, and finishing. The ultimate prices for such handcrafts are incredibly low. Only a few dollars for a finished jardiniere, even less for bookends and small figurines. wages are not only less than the men's, but they have a side chore as well. They have to babysit their children while they work. As darkness overcomes the land, most Haitians end their day. As this view of Port-au-Prince indicates, electricity is still for the privileged class. Suddenly, the night people appear, awakening the silence of the empty streets. Pulsing echoes of African music pervade the night. The crowd oscillates rhythmically as it moves down the street. This creative sense of motion combines religion and dance in the African tradition, an expression of superstition and song. Far up in the hills, another type of ceremonial dance is going on, voodoo. To know Haiti is to understand that voodoo is not just pins and black magic. It's an integral part of the mental, moral, and social fiber of the community, a vivid testimony to their heritage. Although Haiti is officially Roman Catholic, the great majority of people practice voodoo. While we have seen authentic voodoo in the past, no cameras are allowed. This voodoo dance, staged for tourists, 
is a tempered version of the frenetic, moaning, pleading, rum-drinking ceremonies that take place deep in the heartland of the country. Poverty of the Haitian peasant extends from the rugged highlands right down to the polluted waterfront. At dockside, crude, unkempt boats have returned to port after an early morning of fishing activity. Haitian fishermen scratch out a meager living by netting the small tropical fish that populate the coastal waters. It is a marginal occupation at best. Haitians are not known to be seafaring. In fact, seldom dare to venture out to sea. One may ask if there is a traditional fear of the sea. Could it be an anguish inherited from the long trips their forefathers took in the packed galleys of slave ships? Much of the waterfront activity involves the transfer of oversized bags of peat from small vessels to shore. Peat is vital to the Haitians' way of life. It is their chief source of fuel for heating and cooking. Prince to explore some of the small towns nearby. Most suburbanites live in rows of tin-roofed houses, perhaps with two or three rooms and no indoor facilities. Their final home is their most elaborate one. Children in these small towns don't see many strangers and are somewhat curious, if not cautious at first. But they are quick to respond to a gesture of friendship, and it was not long before their curiosity gave way to smiling faces and clapping hands.
Music and dance are a spontaneous expression of their warm and simple friendship. They learn to play bamboo instruments at a very early age, but the price of this musical education is high. 80% of them are never taught to read or write. In fact, most books in Haiti are printed in French, which these Creole-speaking youngsters can't even understand. It's spring. The lowlands are green from fresh rains, while the mountains remain a reddish brown. Basically an agronomic economy, most of the country's population scrape out a meager living from the soil, growing tropical fruits, sugar cane, coffee, corn, and beans. countryside, Haitians live very much like their primitive ancestors. Many of their ways have evolved from African tribalism and its traditions. Some make their way as farmers, others as herdsmen, tending cattle on small patches of grazing land. The man dominates the family life, an absolute master within the family nucleus. Common law marriage is the general rule. And the hard-working peasant farmer often keeps two distinct families miles apart in a form of socially acceptable functional bigamy. Thatched roof huts and walls of mud is the predominant architecture in Haiti, as it has been for hundreds of years. The huts generally form a cluster, inhabited by several families linked by ties of kinship. The single room inside is used as a living room and bedroom. Cooking is done outside, on the ground. The responsibility of the family's economic well-being is left to the woman. She brings her produce to the market, takes care of the children, feeds her family, and handles the money. Women have learned total self-sufficiency, which stems from the days when their husbands were conscripted into the army or remained in hiding to avoid slavery. After eight days in Port-au-Prince, we arranged to fly the 125 miles north to Cap Haitian. We boarded a five-passenger plane to make the half-hour flight. If we traveled by car on dirt roads, it would have taken us 10 hours to get there. Haitian is a crowded seaport of about 50,000 people, the second largest city in Haiti. There are no special attractions here, no reason for coming, except one. It is the base camp for the trek to the Citadel, one of the greatest monuments of the Western world. Oh, 
Cap Haitian, for the most part, is cleaner and quieter than Port-au-Prince. The main part of the city is laid out in a tidy checkerwork of narrow, orderly streets. Some sections even have a certain colonial charm. An imposing Catholic church dominates the main square in town. It's Sunday, and the neatly clad children just came from services. Catholicism seems to be a dominating force here. In fact, when we were looking for somewhere to stay, we were told that the most reasonable place was at the convent. Our four days of living with the nuns was an experience in itself. Most of the city's activity centers around the Clooney Marketplace, an active slave trading center during colonial times. Fruits and vegetables are brought here by the peasant women who hike in from the rugged North Plains. You must be a special kind of traveler to enjoy the inside of a Haitian marketplace, or even Haiti for that matter. For Haiti is not for everyone, particularly those who are looking for a tropical paradise. You won't find, for instance, the usual temple fielding things to do. There's not much swimming, tennis, golf, or fancy restaurants. Then why Haiti? Because it is an island of fascinating people. An island of people simultaneously enveloped in happiness and misery. The only island in the Caribbean that offers the visitor both culture and cultural shock. The second day at Cap Haitian, we drove to Milo, a village at the base of the mountain that leads to the citadel. Here, we visited the ghostly remains of San Susi, once the majestic palace where King Christophe reigned while the citadel was being built. Earthquakes and time have eaten away at the palace, and only a shell remains. King Christophe was a brutal despot whose presence stalked like a colossus through the history of this ravaged land. It was here, at Sans Souci, the emperor shot himself with a silver bullet after he was threatened by rebellion. The citadel sits on a rugged mountain 3,000 feet above the San Susi Palace. To get there, you can either ride over a rocky path on horseback or hike the nine-mile round trip on trails. We elected to hike. Haiti, Sherry, says Haiti is my beloved land. Oh, I never knew that I'd have to leave you to understand just how much I miss the gallant citadel where days long ago brave men served this country well Haiti Sherry is my beloved land oh I never to leave you to understand just how much I miss the gallant citadel where days long ago brave men served this country well
fishery now i've returned to your soil so dear let me hear again the things that give music to my ear work laughter and play yes we'll always be this way the three-hour climb we finally reached the citadel in a way this massive structure was more of an achievement than the great pyramids of egypt most of the huge stones that make up its 12-foot thick walls had to be lugged 3,000 feet up the mountain. It took 16 years and the labor of 200,000 slaves to build this impressive fortress, considered impregnable. It is said that if 10 straining men could not drag a piece of equipment to the mountaintop, the irascible Kristoff would put five of them to death, leaving the five horrified survivors with the task of hauling the same burden up to the top by themselves. All told, 20,000 slaves died in the process. Within the citadel, there were enough supplies of food, water, and ammunition to sustain 15,000 soldiers in battle for several weeks. 45,000 cannonballs weighing 60 pounds each were stored against an attack. A grandiose monument to the absurd the citadel was never besieged. It was over a century after the death of King Christoph that Haiti became the first black republic in the world. The price of its freedom was high. The progress of its people was painfully slow. Is this an omen for other black nations now trying to throw off centuries of oppression? This remains to be seen.